Paul, thanks for joining me. Uh, are you well? Everyone safe? Yeah, all good in the Sheffield household. Yeah, uh, kids are being homeschooled and yeah, we're all healthy, so all good. You, you've been doing some of the homeschooling or you, have you left that to you? Uh, <laughs> my wife's taken the brunt of that. Uh, I get called in when, the, when, when some of the subjects hit my area, but yeah. It's a, it's been it's a, been a tough one. Look, in this conversation, I mean, you know, I know there's all the stuff around coronavirus, and I don't want to dwell too much on that. But I, I would like to just ask you how it's changed your thinking as a CEO, because I assume you're working from home here. I don't know what the situation is, what your plans are for returning to the office, how you'll do that. But um, as a challenge, how have you found it? Well, I guess there's been different phases of it that we've um, faced into the challenges in different stages. So the initial uh, big um, challenge was getting everyone working from home uh, within a matter of a week, actually. Uh, so a, we've got about 1,100 people in our customer business across both brands. Um, and within a week of uh, lockdown, or at least the, the notification of lockdown, uh, we were able to get everybody at home. And then... The next two to three, maybe even four weeks, was really an IT challenge, getting everyone fully enabled working from home. So you know, whereas we got people initially with minimum capability and the, the essentials, uh, we've managed to improve that quite considerably to the point where now I think we're in a, a, in a pretty good operational position as a business um, and people are adjusting. And it's, yeah, it's been tough but we are really finding some positives and trying to work out which bits we take forward and into our new way of working it's i mean it's been interesting and a unique challenge yeah hey, absolutely and, and I'm, I'm sure it wasn't in your you know ceo's playbook i haven't met one ceo who had that pandemic page 75 go to that exactly yeah it was um all of our business continuity plans were tested and um probably uh yeah, as you say, we didn't have this pandemic in our plan, um, but it's it's great. I mean, the, the 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 focus we've had and the ability to deliver change throughout a crisis is something we'll take forwards and try and build it into BAU and try and use that drive and capability and focus in the future. One thing I was going to say is, do you think you're going to have a different attitude to things like home working, like many CEOs? I assume you're going to have to have social distancing so that changes the way whether you work on rotors is that stuff you're looking at yeah yeah we're, we're we're right in the middle of that work at the moment even when our offices potentially can open up and we're at the moment our standing assumption is from september onwards right. uh maybe how to have a limited number of people in our offices uh so still the majority working from home so that builds with that 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 brings with it the opportunity to have people rotating through the offices and we're really thinking about why What's the purpose or what's the value of having an office? Uh, it's certainly not for someone to go and sit on the phone all day, taking call after call and not interacting with colleagues. But offices are uh, great collaboration spaces and that's how we intend to use them. And uh, also recognizing that all of our employees, like all our customers are very different and have different circumstances. So we will have some who desperately want to get back into the office because they're uncomfortable at home. And we have some who are thriving working from home with the with the flexibility that we've been able to give them. So uh, it's a great opportunity for particularly a, a call centre environment uh, to work out how we can have virtual call centres and uh, that that more flexible approach to work. In 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 a sentence, what do you think you've learned about yourself during this? Um, I think we I've had to find new ways of communicating with people and engaging people. Um, it's quite incredible, really. We've gone, is it 14 weeks now since, yeah. um, I think it was the 22nd of March, uh, where we really changed the way we work uh, without seeing people face to face. And that's just but you're incredible. still running a business? Yeah. Uh, we're still, you know, the activity levels, the change programs are in flight, the um, drive to deliver the strategy, the drive to improve our services to customers, that's all happening and all remotely without people working face to face. And I think it's fair to say that we are all desperate to get back to social interaction um, uh, and the triggers for that, um, including hospitality reopening next month, hopefully. And we're all desperate to, to get back to that, but we've 
we've proven just what you can do through methodical interactions on Zoom or uh, Teams and uh, remote working. So, so I, I guess in, back to your question, what, what have I learned about myself? Um, well, first of all, I've had to be far more methodical in my approach, m far more planned and, and make concerted effort to communicate and engage with people, both individually and as teams. And uh, hopefully I've done a pretty good job of it. Uh, I've done my best and that's all we can do. We can all do our best to, to react to the situation we're in. Yeah, um, without, without doubt. Let's talk about your customers. Um, briefly, tell the audience who your customers really are, because you're sort of running two businesses that people may have heard of. One, obviously, Haven, and the other is, is Opus. So slightly different. <clears throat> Give us a little up sum of who your customers are across both, yeah. and then we'll talk about some of the challenges they've faced. Well, I, I would describe our uh, customer business as one business with two brands. Um, and those brands are certainly focused on different parts of the market. So Haven has a uh, background and legacy of being strong in industrial and commercial supply, uh, but also including some smaller uh, customers. Uh, and Haven's doing really well as a, as a brand and as a, um, as a team uh, in supplying energy to water companies. So we've got a really strong presence in the water sector. Uh, transport as well and customers like Gatwick Airport um, and then through into the smaller INC segments um, where uh, I mean, Haven Power's got 55,000 meters on supply um, supplying about 12 and a half terawatt hours conversely Opus has got 350,000 meters on supply um, serving around five terawatt hours uh, so you can see from that just those figures Opus is really um, prominent in the smaller, um, smaller medium enterprise market and the smaller corporates um, with a good presence in housing associations, uh, typical SME customers, um, but also some, some larger retail chains as well. So, re so across mm -hmm. both brands, across the yes, business, yeah. we are um, pretty diverse in our customer base. And your customers have been affected differently. You know, big corporates have got broad shoulders. You know, I've heard things have affected everyone but they're bigger enough to hold it. A lot of your smaller customers will have furloughed staff. A lot of them will be facing uncertain times um, and wondering what's energy and energy as a sector. You know, I think this, this, this uh, pandemic has shown us a really good thing about energy, how reliable we are, how as a sector we've kept the lights on, we've provided the power, we've helped the hospital, all of those things. But the other side is that really tricky one that's always bugged the energy sector, which is how good is it with dealing with customers and customers' issues? When customers will come to you in the next few months and say, I might need a payment holiday, I'm struggling, you know, I don't know if my business is going to survive, I need help with my energy. What will you say to them? How can you help these people? Well, it's already happened. It's been happening since... Uh, probably this, about the second week of April when we're issuing invoices and bills for March consumption and customers were already uh, closed down at that point, particularly hospitality, leisure, mm. small retail. Um, so we've been dealing with this now for 10 or 12 weeks. Um, our, our response to is, uh, first and foremost, we want to help our customers. Uh, we've moved what was traditionally a collections activity into a debt prevention activity, changed the mindset of all of our agents on the phone speaking to customers uh, we've educated them in the government support schemes so that they're able to talk to customers and give advice and we've also tried to take a broader um, position of help for our customers um, in working with business deadline which is a charity we've invested in and contributed to their activity so that they can help customers not manage just their energy bills but look at all of their costs um, as a business and help them um, prioritize payments and manage their costs i think what we're seeing now is um whilst we're in as we're coming out of shutdown with retail yeah. going back mm -hmm. non-essential retail going back as of last monday we're seeing now the consumption start to grow again so uh, we meet some sectors were at 90 percent reduction in consumption you know just the bare minimum security and lighting on uh, they're going back to near on full consumption now and I think that there's, for me, that we've had two phases of challenge in, in working with our customers. Initially, when they shut down, how could they pay their invoice for previous consumption? 
How could they access government support, as I said? And now they're coming out of government support, reopening their businesses, building up their costs again. Yeah. Um, and they're going to be quite vulnerable, our customers, because their business models may struggle with, with reduced footfall or... They may have to adapt. Absolutely, yeah. So, so they will have to adapt. And uh, I anticipate over the next two to three months, the way we help customers is going to have to change again. We're going to have to tune them into their consumption, their bill, managing their expenses. And uh, if that involves payment holidays, which um, helps them through it, we will look at that. We already are looking at that with our customers. Do you think that, you know, obviously there's this classic thing of, we all know that t- tough times may be ahead, but there's that element of the cost of sale of getting a customer, retaining them, or then saying, oh, you look, you know, I've got money to make, you you owe me, you know, that there's a culture that's always been that, you know, you've got to sort out your debts. Across UK PLC, that, that's going to have to change, isn't it? Because companies like you are going to have to think, yes, I've got to help these people through this because they're your customer base of the future. Do you think that's a cultural shift we're going to have to have, you know, negotiations between landlords, negotiations between suppliers, and their customers, all these things to try and make sure that we can all just ride the storm that's coming. I, I think that's probably the best way through it for, for companies who are certainly in a B2B uh, environment um, where we're providing essential supplies or services to customers. And of course, we ourselves personally are consumers of those products those companies are making. So um, we are taking a longer term view of how to endure this period of turbulence in the market because uh, mm-hmm. we want to come out of it with with strong and stable customers and uh, partners we can work with and it'd be great to shift the focus as soon as we can out of the pandemic and the crisis management back into the green recovery and the decarbonization of the of the energy industry that's 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 what we set out as our purpose before the pandemic and that's what we're keen to return to as as quick as we can Let's talk about some of that that, that zero uh, ambition. Um, what was what the what's the ambition for your your companies around net zero? Well, Drax launched its target at the end of last year uh, to be negative carbon by twenty thirty. Can you and explain that, what that is? Yeah, in, in in terms of our power generation, and as people would know, Haven and Opus are the two retail brands of Drax. Drax has agreed. Drax has decarbonized the largest um, carbon emitting power station in, in Europe, actually, uh, and converted to biomass. And we're working now on how we continue to decarbonize that whole process. And a key pillar of that is uh, bioenergy carbon capture and storage, uh, which means that we com- complete the circle of um, carbon emissions and, and putting carbon back under the, the North Sea potentially to create a negative carbon power generation cycle. So you're about uh, sequestration, are you, basically? Absolutely, yeah, through pipeline to the North Sea and storage of the CO2. Um, and that's required to get the energy industry to zero carbon, given there is there are some sectors that you simply cannot abate or maybe cool. decades yeah. away from being yeah. able to neutralise in terms of carbon. There needs to be negative carbon to offset those, and that's the role that we think we can play. The energy industry as a whole and the generation sector has so far invested heavily in renewables in terms of wind and solar, which creates a different dynamic for the energy system. It creates that intermittency and the lack of response. Um, And Drax has a great future, a great role to play in that future in terms of providing low carbon and even negative carbon dispatchable, flexible generation to complete, to allow, I guess, to enable the ongoing investment in in wind and solar. Uh, But it all has to come together. We can't run the UK network on wind and solar, um, but we need it to decarbonise. And I think Drax has got a unique part to play in that. And my job is to bring that, um, those developments and that um, decarbonisation story and opportunity to our customers and try and help our customers be part of that, particularly our larger customers who have big agendas themselves and have launched big commitments themselves. Absolutely. Uh, and who have intensive, uh, have intensive process, energy intensive processes. Um, so it's a great opportunity for Drax to partner with its customers with a single aligned purpose. 
when it comes to um, the bigger customers, and obviously we, we talk to a lot of these companies who have joined our, our, our platform, Future Net Zero, and you know, they have bold ambitions. But one of the things that uh, even big companies um, struggle with, or, or even their mindset is changing, is the instalment of assets, the, the infrastructure costs, capital costs. What are you looking at for a big INC player who says, you know what, Paul, I like what you're doing, but you know, uh, I, 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 I want to go greener, I want to go further down the net zero pathway, but I don't want to have it on my books. I don't want to have infrastructure on my books. I don't want to have a biomass boiler or all these things or CHP, whatever it is may be. Are you now looking at providing a financial route? Because that's come out very strongly that people want to go net zero, but they don't really want to have the balance of those assets on, on, on their books. Are you looking at sort of funding models for people? Um, I wouldn't say that's not our focus. That's not our, um, that's probably not the benefit we can add. We're not, we're not, the, probably not the, the cheapest provider of capital to customers. Uh, but certainly we need to work with our customers f to help them find the capital. Uh, we bring the, the ideas, the, the, the wherewithal to look at the energy estate of a customer and the infrastructure and, and help them work on a plan. Uh, and it doesn't always involve heavy capex. Uh, right. Often it's, it's a matter of shifting consumption, using the assets they've already got. Um, where we are um, really trying to push forward the developments is on electric vehicles and decarbonizing the vehicle fleets of some of our customers. And we've made some really good um, initial steps on that with our customers to, to provide electric vehicles and the infrastructure and the telematics that help them manage the, the carbon footprint and the optimization of their transport. Uh, that's, that's an area, it's not a huge capex um, because they have to replace vehicles on a, on a regular cycle anyway. Um, and that's something we're, we're uh, quite proud of what we've achieved so far in that area. So do you think that there's an option people perhaps are not considering, which is people think I need the on-site generation, the behind the meter. You're actually saying there are things that can be done without massive capital outlay. Well, there, there are steps you go through, I think, that the, um, it's an the LED lighting, yeah. All the that first 10% is yeah. behavior. The yeah. second 10% might be optimization and uh, um, behavioral driven actions. And uh, then you may go further into on-site generation. Um, but it doesn't have to be on-site. Not all our customers have got the premise or the, the land or the property to, to do this. And for those customers, we're looking at we're working with them set to link them up with renewable generators. We purchase energy from over 2000 small independent generators. Right. Um, and we, we can link customers up with that through PPA st structures. So that customers essentially have virtual on-site generation. Uh, they're linked with a, a farmer in the same county with, with uh, 100 or so small wind turbines or solar panel units in their, in their ground. So, uh, there are many different ways of doing it. It doesn't. I think that the concept of a, cust a large industrial customer building on-site generation is perhaps it's a pretty. Um, uh, I mean, of course, that's an option for some, but it's yeah. quite unsophisticated as a as a solution when there are so many other things we can do around uh, demand shifting um, and corporate PPAs, and then decarbonizing some of their. Uh, um, energy usage, including EVs. Let's talk about two areas that you, you, you've brought up there. One is th this concept of, you, 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 you said it yourself, local energy markets, people talk about peer-to-peer -peer trading. You know, um, I, I remember visiting um, uh, Haven Drax a few years ago and you had a really big, sophisticated trading desk and all of that. Do you believe that businesses in the future, as we head towards net zero, you'll be buying very differently? You'll be buying different times you'll be buying locally how are you seeing that kind of trading model changing over the next five years or so do you think there's, there's going to be a real shift to just generally buying on a spot market or things like that um well, i think there'll be definitely a focus uh, another parameter to the optimization of the energy requirements of the company so far that, that's focused on let's say trying to secure the cheapest price uh, locking in at the cheapest level or having a risk management strategy that they work with their energy supplier uh, to achieve or to, to implement. 
Um, the other parameters well, are industry standard, isn't it? That's the way it's been for, for years, for decades. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the <clears throat> I think that we're reaching a tipping point now where larger customers are realizing that the time they use energy is as important as how much they use. Uh, and <clears throat> the digital developments that we have, and I know other suppliers have, are allowing customers to uh, automate the optimization of their consumption and shift load where they have processes within their businesses that are uh, able to be shifted. Uh, even you know, take a really simple example, a supermarket with, with um, freezing units. You can turn a freezer off for half an hour every four hours with no degradation to the uh, quality or the storage of the food or risk, risk of, the, um, of keeping that food. Uh, there are many ways you can do that. Air conditioning units in hotels and um, there's great developments that allow customers to optimise when they use energy. Um, and then over the next five years plus, I think that will just lead, one thing will lead on to another and uh, we'll see customers um, worry about the carbon intensity of the power, the cost of the power when they use their power. Uh, and then ultimately will be, depending on their own uh, agendas, will have a preference for a certain source of power, whether it's wind or solar or biomass. You're talking about providence, to... providence for where your energy comes from. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and all companies, I think, are becoming far more um, interested in their supply chain and the ethics of their supply chain. And uh, that's, you know, it's a great opportunity for us to link customers up with either our renewable independent generators or our own uh, biomass generation uh, or our own hydro generation um, and, and customers will have a greater choice. And, and how keen are you to work with small generators? Because people think you get all your power from Drax and that's what you're selling. But you seem to suggest that you're, you're more open-minded than that. Yeah, we've, we've, we've built a quite an established business in, in buying energy and helping small independent generators uh, effectively monetize their their power through to the market. Uh, so we provide balancing services and we you know, provide a long-term outlet for the, for the power and an income stream to those customers. Um, some customers are seeing that they can optimize their own business, whether they are a farmer or tomato grower or yeah. whatever, by having solar panels and using it for their own, to offset their own consumption, but also selling that to the market. Um, we're in no, no means kind of, a dedicated we don't, we don't in any way have a dedicated supply from drax power stations uh, we're here to provide services to the market both on the on the demand side for customers consuming but also small independent generators uh, they've got a really important role to play in the energy system um, and as you say you you'll see a greater localization of the energy market over time before we end two things i want to talk about uh, data right so all the things you're talking about, data is going to become even more important as businesses start to have more monitoring, have smarter meters, have yeah. smarter devices, have smarter, you know, you talk about EV fleets that might be taking signal uh, messaging to, to dump their battery load or whatever. How big a challenge do you see there is around the data side? And what are you as a, as a group looking at around data services because that's kind of be, going to become a big part of what you'll have to offer isn't it yeah and it's become a integral part of our conversations with customers either at the tender stage before we've won a customer or when we've got them on supply and we're working with them to deliver the optimization commitments that we would have put into that tender um, and all our conversations now are based on uh, consumption data combining that with market data and price data to try and find a better solution. It's very rare now that we tender for a large customer simply on management fee or price. Uh, we're tendering on a, uh, based on a, a commitment or promise to optimize their consumption over a period of time and save them X percent of their energy cost. Uh, and data's at the heart of that. With EVs, we're investing at the moment in, in our telematics and our reporting to, as you say, to allow customers to manage their fleets. First of all, know uh, their mileage, know where their people are, which had, has added safety benefits, but then to optimize their charging regimes. Mm. Uh, so that they, uh, we're trialing ourselves at the moment, vehicle to grid, 
um, discharging uh, so their, their vehicle fleets can become a generation asset or at least a storage asset. Uh, there's, yeah, there's some great breakthroughs that are currently uh, coming into the market and being delivered to customers. We're still in trial stage with, with some of them, but um, I sense they are starting to gain momentum now uh, and yeah, it's an exciting future. And let's, let's end with that. Um, we have the target of 2050 for net zero. Do you think we'll get there? I think the energy industry, um, I think the energy industry will. Um, I think even this pandemic has given us a new perspective on, on behaviours and what's absolutely necessary. Um, so I think whereas before it looked really challenging and it looked to stretch and we do all we could on the generation side to decarbonise, but had less of an influence on the demand side, mm -hmm. I think the, the consumers of energy now are um, perhaps combining these current challenges we've had and are seeing there is genuinely a, a lower carbon future with less commuting, less transport. Um, the focus is given people on necessary travel only uh, as opposed to surplus or um, luxury travel. I think I think just think it's opened people's minds up to what we can do with a different way of living. And also people have been at home now for 14 weeks and have enjoyed a different quality of life, except, of course, for those who have unfortunately fallen ill because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, those who have you know, have avoided the, the illness have seen a different quality of life. And I don't think people will be very quick to shift straight back to the to the rat race of commuting to. London every day and yeah, too right. you know, fly, flying overseas for a four hour meeting, that sort of thing. So I think this will be, I think this has been a, a really, a positive out of this will be that it unlocks another level of um, potential in decarbonizing. So I think we'll get there.